So now it is my great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker tonight, who is Jill. Um, I love dear Jill, Jill dearly. I have watched her come in, which has been really, really cool, and grow up, which has been really, really cool to be able to do that shoulder to shoulder with such an amazing woman. She has kind of just walked through life and shown me personally, at least, how to do things to better oneself sober, like finishing school and, and pursuing <coughs> dreams and buying a house and just doing things that I never, ever thought was possible. So Jill kind of paved the way for me, and for that I am eternally grateful. Um, but this is kind of her AA story debut-ish, kind of. It is here. That's all that matters here. This is her Alano AA story debut. So with that, let's give it up for Jill. Yay! Wow. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jill. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Jill. And um, I kind of, it was really funny. I have to tell you a funny story. So I was sitting there one night, and everybody was saying, oh, it's going to be your story. And I looked over at a dear friend, and I said, I, I just don't want to say a lot because, you know, I want to be really spiritual. And she said, it's okay. You're not. <laughs> it's okay. Like, you know what, what you really are, and what my sponsor has told me is you are someone who is living the promises and certainly didn't get everything she wanted, but certainly has gotten way more than she expected. And so um, with that, I, I look out at so many friends that I dearly love. I really, she's right. I, I really did. I grew up here. And um, I went, so if you see my friends squirming or they're like, <clears throat> it's like that just means I'm lying to myself again, okay? Because that's what we do here, right? That's what we did in our disease. And so um, tonight, I just really pray that um, God is with me and that I can share some experience, strength, and hope about how to, how to stay sober. Um, I just say, I used to know an old-timer years ago that used to say, you know how you, get, you become an old-timer? You don't drink and you don't die, right? <laughs> they used to say that. I mean, she had like 50 years of sobriety when I knew her. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about what happened and what, what it was like. So um, I start, this is not my first rodeo. I've done this a couple times. And um, I've been fighting this, in my opinion, for a very long time. Um, I ended up in my first drug rehab at, eight, at 19, and I spent my 21st birthday sober. And when I got sober this time, I counted like all the years that I had been sober and all the years that I drank. And really, honestly, from that time until now, I have been sober longer than I have drank. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that doesn't say a whole lot. Everyone goes, yeah, but th at the same time, it's like that's how progressive it was for me. And so, um, yes, I spent my 21st birthday sober, and then I met my, my husband really quick, and then, you know what, I never drank in a bar. You know, I was one of those young people that came in and said, I don't really have an alcohol problem. I have a drug problem, right? And um, that certainly didn't end that way. And so um, I, met my, I met my husband. Long story short, we ended up here, and um, I got pregnant with my first son. And I was like, oh, gosh, like I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic. I knew this. I, nev I never knew I wasn't. I was like, what am I going to do? And my ex-husband was a member of the LDS church. And I thought, nobody drinks there. What a great idea. So I joined it. I did. I joined it. And there's a part in the book when I came back, I figured out, you know, there are many, there are several ways to stay sober. And I stayed sober from probably the time I was 27 until I was probably 39, which was great because my kids never saw me drunk up until that point. My kids got into teens um, really quickly. I'm, I'm a nurse. I was a surgical technologist. I was standing in an operating room at 19 before I was even legal to drink. I've done it my whole life. Um, and it's, it's a tough world. It's, it's really rough. It is not, you know, you got a surgeon, one of the most educated people in the world, screaming and yelling at you, and you had to figure out really quickly what to do. The great part was is I kind of had ADD, so when they yelled at me, I could pay attention. <laughs> and so it worked. It worked for me. I became very good at what I did, and I always wanted to be a nurse. I had applied to nursing school. One thing about me is nothing – I've always failed at everything once, at least once, if not twice, if not three times. And what I've learned in life is that, for me, it's not falling down that's the problem. It's how quick you get back up. 
And so I just, I don't know how I got here. I just didn't stop. I just kept trying. So we got a, you know, the one thing about religion, I had never, when my, back up, when I was six, my father died. And after that, my mother never walked into a church again. To this day, really has never done that. But I will tell you, my mother is a phenomenal enabler. And I would just, I can just tell you, like, this woman has saved my life. She has listened to everything. She has put up with me. And um, I'll get to that in a minute. So long, so I get married. I'm, I have two kids. And I'm thinking, great, my life's going to be perfect. I'm not drinking. I'm good. And um, I find out that my son has autism at three. And then I proceed to spend the next eight years just trying to get him to talk. And as crazy as my ex-husband is, and I was, um, that was the one thing that I think we really did right. And we were really, really good parents. And um, he's phenomenal. And I have to tell you that when I came here, it was really difficult to bring him in. I can tell you some really funny stories. I One time I took him to Champions, and he was having his echolalia, and he had earphones in, and this guy walked up to me, and he goes, hey, you know what? He can't talk on the phone in here. And I was like, he's not on the phone. <laughs> like, he has autism. And then another time I brought him into a women's meeting, and the, and he's, like, grown. And, he, you know, and she said, you can't have a man in here. And I'm like, don't worry, he can't repeat anything we say. <laughs> and so it was really, it made it very hard. It was not the easiest thing in the world. And so what I love is he comes in here, and he knows exactly where he sits. And everybody, when he walks by, he goes, hey, mister. Hey, mister, he won't let any of you in. I call him, your, he's your door greeter forever, okay? You're just, that's just the way it is. But I remember Anne very much, and I would think of her often, and, man, she was an example to me about, like, yeah, you can keep coming back, and it doesn't matter who you bring. So for me, so in the very end of my drinking, so I can get into experience, strength, and hope, um, I talked about this a lot with a friend, and it, um, once I started, you know, I get into nursing school, I have no coping skills. I'm stopped going to church. What, what's the first thing we do? We start drinking. And, um, that was a very sordid story. In the very end, I would work all day. I would go to nursing school. I would stop at the liquor store. I would go to McDonald's. I'd pour half the Coke out. And by the time I got home, I had a good buzz, right? That's what I needed. Cause I had to get up the next day. And um, I did that for two years. I don't even know how I made it through nursing school. It was a blur. And I remember um, when I met a nurse in recovery and she said, yep, you know what? We could be high as, sh we could be as, high as a kite and um, we would save three lives that day. And we didn't have any idea how we did it. And so um, that was kind of, and so it, as time went on, of course, my marriage. And, and w one thing when... Um, when I first got sober, I went to hear a woman talk, and she kept saying, well, there was another him, and there was another him. And I kept saying, why doesn't this woman just tell us these guys' names? And she kept saying all through the thing, water levels out, water levels out. And, and, I just kept, and it took me a long time to understand what she was saying. And what she was really saying to me was, you know what, you attract what you are. And... Um, <clears throat> In the book, I think that it talks about we put ourselves in harm's way and in a position to be hurt because of our insecurities and the, and the things that were going on inside of us. And I certainly um, have a golden record in that. I attract what I am, and sometimes that wasn't the most healthiest person. And so in the end, I think that for me what happened is I just started to believe all the bad things that the world said. And then all of a sudden, I like couldn't look in the mirror, and I drank over everything. And it became very dark and abusive, and, um, and uh, there was a lot of pills involved. And um, to me, really, honestly, the last two year and a half of my drinking, two years of my drinking, is really a blur, honestly. I have no idea why I'm here. And, you know, I just, I can't believe it that I'm, I'm alive. So by the time I got here, man, it was, I, I had lost my family. I had lost my job. And finally one day I was sitting, I was sitting in, in, in my boyfriend's apartment, stirring my bourbon at 7 o'clock in the morning, high and just thinking, 
you know, well, is this what it's going to be like? And all of a sudden, I heard a voice in my head that just said, if you don't change, you're going to die. And I really had come to the, and, and prior to those two years, what had really gone through my head was the church didn't work. AA didn't work. Like, I'm going to die of this. Like, I'm going to die, and I don't know what to do. I'm getting high during the day. I'm drinking to sleep, and it's just, and I started all over again. And, you know, and, and I, I, what I laugh at at the time back then is I would say, I'm fine. What's wrong with all of you? And, you know, that denial is like a self-preservation. It's, it's like, it's so sick how we think that. And um, every day I would get up, I would, I would get sober, I would take a bunch of pills, I would get sober. And then by 1.30, I would, I would discover a, a great resentment to go home and drink over, right? I would create a resentment and I'd be looking at my watch like, how soon can I get out of here? You know, and then it became... In the morning, it was, I was so sick, okay, how, and then once the hangover wore off, okay, well, I got to come up with a reason to go home and get drunk. And there was so much lying to myself, I think, more than anything. And then I would come home, I'd get drunk, I'd go, and I'd do it all over again. And it, it became this vicious cycle. And the one thing I didn't notice until this time when I got sober is how physically sick I was becoming. Like every morning I was retching, every morning I was throwing up, every morning I was having pain in my liver, I was having pain in my back, I was swollen, I was probably four sizes bigger than this in, in my abdomen. It was, and I was just so physically ill too, and I was really, really tired. I was so tired and so broken when I got here. I just, I just didn't, I, I don't know, I don't know what happened. Like it's, I kept trying, and I think of it often, Lester said, he said, you keep getting on the elevator and you keep pressing the up button and the elevator keeps going down and you got to figure out how to get off the elevator. You know, he used to, I, I've always thought of that. And what I love is there are so many people in this room that have said things to me that have stuck, that have saved my life. And so mm -hmm. um, I think for me, one of the first things that happened is one of somebody in this room said, I am the person who soon forgets the incomprehensible demoralization that I once experienced. And I had to add, and then I convinced myself I can do it again. That was always my problem. Every time I got a few things back, I said, hey, I got this. I'm in control. I'm going to go and keep doing it. So I went into treatment. And, and so finally, I checked myself into treatment. And I love what... what um, Dudley says, I worried so much about what you all thought, but when I got here, I worried about my anonymity, right? And so I didn't tell anybody where I was for like eight days. I didn't even tell my mother. They were, they were scared to death. They thought I was going to die. And, um, and I just disappeared for eight days. And I finally called my mom and they said, we thought you checked yourself in again. Um, I was, at that point, I was just unemployable. I couldn't even do, I couldn't even function. Um, without a drink or a drug. I actually, when I lost my job, I went to an interview, and it was where I had done, I had tried an IOP three years before that never worked, and I remember driving up to the building with, a, with bourbon in my bottle thinking, God, please let this be an intervention. Please, like, that's how bad I just wanted off that merry-go-round. And so I went into treatment, and they put me in a P&E program, which is called a Professional exec Executive Programs, and I had to report to the board. And I remember, like, you know, you're like, oh, well, I'm here with, like, important people, <laughs> right? I'm here with important people. And, and, you know, they sat us down, and they said, you know why you're in this important room? And we're like, why? And they go, because you guys have a higher relapse rate. And you guys fail more than everybody downstairs. And it was like, oh, God, this sucks. <laughs> and you guys got to work harder. And so that's what we're going to expect you to do. And so I had this fabulous... Um, counselor, everybody hated him because he called you out. And I remember one day I was sitting in that room with like all these people, like doctors and nurses, and one was an FBI agent. One guy had went to West Point, like all of these things. And I'm like, and he says, "Who do you think is the best manipulator in the room?" And I'm like, oh. I just I don't know why he knew that. And I put my head down like, okay. And they all were like pointing at each other. And he, and he stops, and he looks at me, and I'm like, oh. And, he, and they go, no, it can't be her. And they, and they said, see, she's already got you all fooled. You don't even know it, do you? 
And I was like, oh, that really sucks. <laughs> like, you know, and, um, you know, because I was really good at being the victim. I, I played it well. And the, I played it so well, I believed it. That was the great part about it. I remember when I was, when I was with Max's husband, and he would say, yep, we believe our lies, don't we? And um, he would say things like, you suffer from the if-onlys. You know, as soon as I got something, I was like, well, if only, you know, I had this. And I was just always ill at ease and discontent no matter what. And so um, I really uh, am grateful that he said that. And he said, if you want to make a change, like, here's a mirror. And I want you to walk around with it all day. And I want you to look in, in the mirror if you want to change the world. Stop being the victim. Stop worrying about it. And why don't you start changing yourself? And I was like, oh, whatever. It is everybody else's fault. And, and for sure, that's exactly what I told you when I got here. And um, so I, I, I got out. Same exact thing happened to me again. Got, it, got a few things back. Said, I got this. You know what? I'm just going to start with two beers. And I found out very quickly within two days I was drinking just as much as I had, if not more, than when I before had gone into treatment. And I had to call my sponsor. Roberta was my first sponsor. And uh, I said, you got to come because I can't be alone. And that night when I went home, the, my boyfriend had said, like, get off my porch. I don't want to see you anymore. I don't want to talk to you. And I got to go home and face myself with God. And you know what? They're, they're just, I wasn't going to change until there was no one left to call. There was no one cared. I had ran <laughs> through every person and everybody and everything I had. And I was running out of money. And I was in trouble. And I called Roberta and I said, I need you to come get me. I can't, I can't be alone. I have to get tested today. And I had drank. And what am I going to do? So I'm, I'm, you know, downing a liter of water, waiting till the last minute um, to go and drink, uh, to, you know, to go and take my test. And you know what? Roberta showed up with somebody else and she stayed there with me the whole day. And, you know, it was pretty scary because that night when that happened, I went home, I took a handful of pills, and um, I got to lay there with a whole lot of AA in my head. And I heard things in my head like, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Give The, the program will give freely of what you find. Um, this is but a simple program if you're just honest. And I heard all of these things in the preamble and everything else, and I thought, that's it. I haven't made conscious contact with God. Like, I don't know how to do this. How do I do this? And she stayed with me all day, and she drove me back down to the, to the treatment center. And I, as I had reported myself to the board, so I had a really hard time, like, finding a job. She told me I was the only person she ever saw look for a job as hard as I had, and I had just gotten a job. And because as soon as you would get offered a job and you'd say, hey, I'm in TPAP, and they'd be, thank you, you have a nice day. You, that's exactly what they would say to you. And I had one, and I had a wonderful woman up in Conroe that helped me, and I'm still dear friends with her today. And um, she said, well, you, you can't lose this job. And I'm like, okay, well, what? because they said check yourself <laughs> back in. And I said, what am I going to do? And she said, that's it. I'm taking you home. And you're going to do exactly what I say. And I was like, okay. And so she took me home for her, in her house for a week and sobered me up. And she did a lot of things that were really amazing. She said, get out of that bed. You don't get to sit here in life and feel sorry for yourself. You're going to get up and go help somebody else. And you're going to get up and you're going to go to one of those big meetings at that club. And you're going to announce that you have 30 days, that you're a newcomer. And every time you have to do that, you're going to keep those chips and you're going to put them in your wallet. And um, I, I thank God I only had to do it three times, but I'll never forget the night I went in. The, it, I had done it a couple times before, and, and I went in, and I remember it was a big meeting, and I had to say, like, I have, you know, I, I have less than 30 days, and I heard the room gasp. And for the first time in my life, like, you cared, and it mattered, and I didn't know what that was like. Everybody had given up. It had been so long. I, I remember, like, the look on Lester's face, and I was like, I just got tired of letting everybody down and myself. And finally, I wanted to do, you guys, you guys still had my back. You still loved me, no matter what happened. So, um, and I felt pretty bad up until about 90 days. And so, 
In my first year, um, I still hung out with a him, and he still drank. And everybody said, like, don't hang out with him. But the beautiful part was is my drinking interfered with his drinking. So he said, you can't drink, and I didn't. I don't know why I did that, but that's exactly what happened. So my first year in sobriety, I ended up, so right after that, I ended up getting another job. And like within three months, I had a $12,000 sign-on bonus. I had a job. I was, I was promoted in three months. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I can do this. And so that first year, he drank on the porch and I earned a bachelor's degree. And what I learned out of that was, it was for me, was, you know what? It's not so much about, stay, about what they're doing, but it's me staying in the same place. I've got to keep moving. And change happens, and that's the way that that keeps working. And so I was, I was uh, the manager of this hospital, and it was a, it was a terrible job. And I learned a lot of stuff about what I could actually do, how I could actually be in charge. I didn't really expect that. And um, I got another job offer, and I went over to a different hospital, and I had this really dynamic guy. That and like the one thing about all my jobs, because I had to tell you for three and a half years that I had a problem, so all my bosses had to know. And I can tell you that today what T. Pappen did for me, which we were just talking about earlier, is that they forced me to learn to take care of myself and that I was no good to anybody unless that was happening. And that really what the board is for is to, <clears throat> is to protect me from the public. And that you, I have to take care of myself if I'm going to serve the public. And I'm really grateful that they did that. Of course, every time you felt like going out and drinking, you thought, well, wow, I may not have a livelihood. So that gave me enough time to change and to work on myself. And so um, soon uh, I ended up getting uh, Dawn Hughes. You all know her as uh, my first, as my second sponsor. And, you know, the one thing that we did is we ran a lot in my first year. She'd say, meet me up in the woods and go run. And I didn't know what to do, so I just showed up and I ran. And I would just stare at her feet like, okay, I'm just going to do what you're going to do. Like, because I don't know what to do. And I would call her upset and she would say, have you cleaned your house? (laughs) And I would say, no. She'd say, well, you know what, why don't you take a shower and clean your apartment and call me back? Because I didn't know how to do, I didn't know how to live like this. I had never done it. So, um, uh, so then finally, and, and one day she made me really, she made me so upset. I'd called her upset about something and she chewed me out and she set my, set my tail straight. And I was so mad at her. And she said, hey, um, I want you to take care of my friend because I love her. And I started to cry. <laughs> and so, um, and that, you know, and I thought like, oh my God, like, you know, all my secrets and you still love me. Like I had never had that in my life. And so, um, I got about a year and a half, two years sober. And, uh, finally one day she said, Jill, you have some codependency issues. (laughs) And I think that you need to address them. And if you don't, I'm afraid you're going to drink again. And I was like, well, okay, what do I do? And she said, um, well, make a, make a dinner date with this person. And I went to meet that person. And she goes, oh, no. Yeah, I know. You're way too sick for me. I, I, you're going to have to go get somebody else. And you need Mary Pat. And I was like, okay, so send me your number. I met Mary Pat um, through a text. And I was just willing to do what you asked because I did not want to go back to that dark, scary, lonely place that I had been. And I didn't want to be fuzzy anymore. And I didn't want to not remember. And I didn't want to, like, keep telling you that I was okay when I really wasn't. And I, you know, and so for me, that was just, it was so difficult. Um, it, was, it was so painful. And some days, I, in the first couple of years, I didn't go to a lot of meetings because, one, I was working a lot. And, two, like, some days that's all I could handle was like going to work and coming home and just staring at the TV. Like, okay, you know. I, you, what's hard to explain is I really wasn't sure at a year and a half sober if I was going to live. Like, I really wasn't sure. I knew that if I drank and I used again, I was probably going to die or I was going to kill myself. And so I really, um, 
I, I that's what I did. And so for the and then finally one day I I started working with people. I started coming. I started sticking my hand out. And um, for me, one day I had this like huge God moment, and I laugh all the time because my God has a sense of humor. So <laughs> things like, hey, I want to. I prayed when I had children. Can I be a great mom? He just gave me the most difficult child in the world, right? And um, I'm in the. So I have this huge God moment in a parking garage, and and I realized like for the first time in about two and a half years. I felt safe, finally, and I felt I might live. It, it ju- I just might get through this. Like, it took two and a half years, three years to do that, to get there. And I was so filled with gratitude. And um, so for me, what I did is a lot of the slogans, a lot of the, uh, the lines in the book, a lot of things that people said here helped me. And Christy would always say, you know, when I got here, I had like an enormous fear of people. And one of the best things was, is Roberta said, only go to women's meetings. Because I was, at this point, I was deathly afraid of men. Like, I just wanted everybody to leave me alone. I had been terrorized and a whole bunch of stuff had happened. And so I only went to women's meetings. And there I could really be me. And then finally, when I got to about three years, I was like, you know, maybe, maybe I should get to know the men. Like maybe I, you know, the best way to do that is to like, why don't I just try to be friends with them? Like, why don't I just get to know them? And like, instead of walking around like gun, like I look like a, I always thought I had this like look on my face, like just stay away from me. <laughs> and like, just please, like I can't handle anything else. And, um, and I, because I started noticing when I went to mixed meetings, like all the women would be like, oh, Jill's here. Oh, Jill's here. Oh, Jill's here. And all the guys would be like, who's she? Who's she? Like, we don't know who this lady is. Oh, she's great. You know, this is so awesome. And so um, this, uh, so uh, my boyfriend, he stuck around and he, you know, we went through on and on, like, here, you drink too much. No, I don't want to see you, blah, blah, blah. And it has been a royal roller coaster. And the really sad part is, is that, Um, he's decided to go do more research. And I had to say, like, I can't do it. I can't do this anymore and stay sober. And so, um, but, you know, I I learned so much when he was around me. What really changed it for me is one thing they said is they said, you spot it, you got it. And so what started happening is he would come home, he would come over, and he would be, like, drunk, and he'd be like... I just got off work like five minutes, like 15 minutes ago. And he's like slurring all of his words. And I'd be like, oh my God, that was me. Like, no wonder nobody believed me. That was a lie, right? I would get in front of my kids, hey. And I, they'd just stare at me and they'd walk back in and they'd shut the bedroom door. And I'd be like, what's wrong? And then I recognized like how much I was really lying to myself. And he said things like, Oh, every day was, this is such a terrible day and I'm so tired. And I started like making these things in my head. Like I'm tired meant I was drunk. Uh, the tough day meant I had created my resentment and, you know, and, and that's how, that's how it went. And I started recognizing more and more of myself in the behavior of what he was doing. You know, like he would be, he'd be like, I feel so physically bad. He'd be drunk as, as drunk as shit. And he'd get in bed and he'd go, do you think it's my smoking? <laughs> and I would be like, oh my God, like this is the stuff I said to myself, didn't we? And I would just be like, oh. And so to me, like what I feel like God had to do is he had to put the disease in front of me every day to witness over and over again to soon recognize that I was just looking in the mirror. And he, and it was just, it was amazing because, you know, why would I be mad that he wants to go to do do more research? I remember Janelle saying, my mother and my sister begged me to quit. My family begged me to quit. I left my own kids because a drink was more important. Why would I think it is any different in someone else? Why would I think that? And who do I think I am that doesn't realize, recognize that the disease is, 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 so is that cunning, baffling, and powerful. And one thing that I started to do when I was first sober is I started to play poker. And I love poker, and I'll tell you why. 
And everybody knows this about me. I love poker because you know what? They are liar, cheats, and thieves. I fit in perfect. <laughs> I fit in perfectly because, you know, and, and it was a great place for me to be that person and then get up and leave and go live honestly. Like, you know what? I could go be, I could do that. I mean, it sounds crazy, but I really was like, I could get that part out of me. That, And, you, and so then what I decided, so the pandemic hit and all of it started from I want a cat. And my, my realtor, I rented, she ended up getting me a townhome because what happened is when I got divorced, I moved to the hood because I didn't feel safe. Somebody had given me that idea. You want to hide from somebody, move to the hood. Nobody's going to bother you. And don't worry. Uh, those people in the hood won't bother you because if they bother you, they're going to jail. And that just made me feel safe. I went, and you know what is right. Like people would run for me in the parking lot. I'm telling you, they, they didn't want any trouble. And I'm telling you, I hid my car. I did. It, it's serious. It's really happened. And so, and then my realtor came, and she's like, "I got to get you out of this neighborhood." And I was like, and she never liked my ex-husband, which was even better. And so, um, it took me two and a half years of sobriety to say, "I'm sorry. I just couldn't stand that man anymore." And it really was. And it, I didn't believe in divorce, but I really just, I just couldn't stand him. He, there was a lot of lying that went on, and he just. He just wasn't the person for me, and I knew it. And so she moved me to a townhome over uh, over here. And so I wanted a cat, but she's highly. She's like, you can't have an animal. I didn't want to buy the townhome. She said, I said, well, let me show you what I was lo- what I was looking at. And I drive her over to this neighborhood, and she says, I'm going to go across the street. And next thing I know, she's like, I'm standing in the real in the in the office, and she says to them, just so you know, she can afford any house in here. And I'm like, I can't. <laughs> I'm like, are you sure? And she's like, yes. And I ended up building this beautiful house that I didn't have, I never expected I would have. And it's incredible because God is great because my house payment is $9 more than my rent. How do you do that? I don't know. I don't. That's why God does. And so I got, and so I built this house. Mary Pat helped me pick out everything. It was like the best experience and um, I was working a lot, and uh, and I got in this house, and I this year of sobriety has really been for me has been about, okay, God, like you put me in this house, like what am I supposed to do with this house? And I said, you know what, you gave it to me, so I'm going to open it to everybody. And so I started inviting every all the ladies over to play poker. And you know what? I'm proud to say they can all deal for themselves. They all know the difference between a straight and a flush. They all know, and, and they they're getting they're getting good. It's time to start inviting the guys so that you can figure out because we're going to beat the pants off you. Because I play poker online and I'm on a table with like six men and I beat them, no problem. We're better players. I have this competitive edge, if you haven't noticed. And if you make me mad, I might run over you and run and then back up a couple times. That was always kind of my MO. Here, I'm going to do that to you because, you know, I'm the inferiority complex with the egomaniac in the same breath. And it's like, you know, you don't cheat on me. I'll show you. I'll make you really sorry. And I'll just, you know, I'll destroy our lives and I'll burn it down. That's what I'll do to you is you hurt me because I thought I was so special, right? And, uh... So I have to laugh about that all the time. but um, And this year has just really, and so I ended up at the very end of last year in the pandemic, I spent one night there and I was there for 22 hours. And I was like, I think 30 years of call is enough. And I called a friend who was went to supply chain and I said, get me a job now. Because it was that bad. The pandemic was very stressful. And I was at the time, which was really great. So with Mary Pat, I'll back up a little bit. I started working a lot of Al Anon steps. I started understanding boundaries. I started understanding where I ended, where I began, and where you ended. And I start. And then what did God do? He put me in charge of 50 people in a 14 operating room. And I was like, Oh my gosh! And I got a whole lot of practice. I had a whole lot of practice of figuring that out and understanding what you needed to do and what you didn't. And I made a lot of people mad. I probably did. But, you know, I knew one thing is that I came there every day with God in my heart, and I made the decision for the greater good. Not for you, not because you were my friend. I made a decision for the greater good, and I used so much 
of the program every day when I was there. And the beautiful part was is that the hospitals I worked at downtown, they were very close together, and a lot of the staff that I had worked with at St. Joseph's had come over to the hospital I was at. And there, I think I've told this story before, there was a, there was a young guy, he had shown up drunk. And before I'd gotten there, um, the other managers had already taken him down to human resources. I knew he was going to blow positive, and it was like, oh, I, you know, I would have sent him home. Of course, I would have been that nice enabler. Let's send you home. So he ended up getting fired. And that day, he came into my office, and he said, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. And at that very moment, like, God worked through me, and I was able to put my paperwork down. And I said, you know what? Losing my job was the best thing that ever happened to me. And it will be for you. And I'm, and so I didn't know what happened to him for like six months. I went over to the new hospital. I walk in there one day and he's, he was there. And when I, my boss hired me, it was really funny because I had to tell him I was in deep happen. And he said, you know, I know even more now that I need to hire you because I had helped somebody else. Everybody who hired me had had an experience was somebody in the TPAP and, and, and had really good um, results. The program really does work well. And so I walk into that hospital and he's there. And he said, I've got a year sober. And I was like, and I actually, I still keep in touch with him. And I didn't know what had happened. He, he's on the south side of town, but you know what? Like, he's just like, I always remembered what you said. And that's what we do here. That, you know, we share our experience, strength and hope, hoping that somebody will hear what we, what we say. And for me, um, another line in the book that really changed my life is in the director. Because, you know, they, they talk about all that. And I, and I was telling Tammy, I just took, had to take a person out, a strengths test in a leadership class. And you know what my first strength was? An arranger. <laughs> Doesn't that sound a little bit like a director? <laughs> kind of does to me. <laughs> and I, when you listen to it, somebody who likes, co- likes to deal with complex problems and figure things out. I'm not an overthinker, right? Um, and so, anyways, so I... So that um, I ended up doing that, and let me see, where was I at? So I know, I, that's the thing, I jump stories all the time. <laughs> so now today, so after I spent 22 hours in the hospital, I ended up getting this job, and so I, there's no more call, no more over hours, and I was like, what am I going to do with all this time? And I committed to like coming to this club and sticking my hand out and making friends and building a life. Because that was the one thing that was really missing. I was working all the time, and I couldn't go to as many meetings as I wanted to. And I, I, I think of Steve, and I think of Danny. You know what? Just get a cup of coffee and come on in and sit all the way down. Or I, with the bacon, I, Steve, I'm committed. I don't know where you are, but I'm committed. And, and that's what I did. I committed, and I started having people over to my house, and I started sticking my hand out. And today I can just tell you that, you know, you know, my ex-husband used to always say bros before hoes, and today it's hoes for, before bros. <laughs> it's like, my women in my life are the strongest things, and the women in my life save me, and they show up when I'm sad, and they hold my hand when I want to cry, and they listen to me, but the nice thing is, is when I'm full of crap, they say, you're full of crap, and that's, that's what happens here. The men stick with the men, and the women stick with the women, and they really... They really have saved my life. And um, because for me here, I'm, my family is all in California. I have no family here except for my sons. And that is it. And so this is it. This is, you know, this is the best and best they can. And I'm the youngest in my family. So I'm already prepared that everybody's going to die before me. So, um, you know, but I don't want to live sad and I'm not. And today I'm so grateful for this program and for the people in this room, like all of you have said something to me at one time or another that has saved me and that has helped me get through a difficult time. And I just cannot tell you how grateful I am that I'm actually alive. Like I just cannot express enough like I'm alive. And like it's that's a miracle in itself because I was I wanted to die. I was going to die. I was like I was taking money out of an ATM machine to go buy drugs to die and all I could hear in my head was if you abandon yourself to God as you understand God if you admit your faults to him if you give freely of what you find and and so today it's not so much about saving me 
It's about giving freely of what I find and keep coming back. And you know what? No matter what, I think of it often like my worst enemy could walk in this room, and if they were broken like I was, I would help them. And that is a piece that I have found like in this program and lots of four steps. I've probably done about four or five four steps, you know, because as a nurse, I'm an overachiever. And so, you know, I thought when I got here, well, if I just do a lot of them and I do them quickly, I'll get better faster, right? And, and I've gotten the nice luxury of figuring out that, you know what, it's not on my time. It's, it's on God's time. And the beautiful part that my sponsor keeps telling me, and I love her so much, and she keeps saying, you are living the promises. You thought you were going to die, and today you don't fear people. You don't fear economic insecurity. I don't regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. And I just cannot believe that I found that freedom. And it wasn't until I really worked the, the steps and in the program over, and it took a couple times because, you know, the first time I was just as honest as I could be. And it wasn't right, and it wasn't thorough, and when I got done, I had to do more, and, um, and I did it. And so what I laugh about is my, my, um, my birthday month is October. So every year I would come to October, and October is filled with a lot of people that have a lot of time. So it's like, oh, Jill gets one year, Jill gets two years, and I would feel really good about myself, and then people would start talking. And I'd get, like, they'd get, like, halfway down, and I'd be like, there's more work to do. This really sucks. <laughs> like, oh. And today, I've wor- I came from I hate this birthday month to I love this birth. I'm honored to sit with those people. And, um, and, it, was, and it is exactly how God wanted it. And uh, so I, I think of the, those things often and those lessons that happen. And I just can't tell you how grateful I am to this club and how committed I am. I bought a house by this club on purpose. When you pull out of my subdivision, you can go in three different directions, and there is a, there is a club within three miles almost each way. And, um, I'm, and I'm so grateful for that. And I bought it close to 1960. And that, there were many reasons why I bought this house, but one of it was because I always want to remember that I could be that person on that street in about 10 seconds. And that, and, and so now when I go and they, they ask me for money, I, I hand it to them because you know what? That could be me. I'm going to sustain a life before I'm going to say, no, you just need to learn your lesson. Because if I'd have had people say that to me and not have people reach out to me when I didn't deserve it, I wouldn't be here. I can tell you that right now. And it's the grace of God. It's the grace of people that really do that for you. And um, so today, the main focus is, you know what, I've got to do, I've got, I am responsible. I am the one that has to be here in case that person walks in. And I've watched a lot of people come in here, and I've watched a lot of people leave. And I had, um, I had one lady that was a sponsee, and she, you know, and willingness is really, a huge issue because I had talked to her and she just didn't want to change anything. She wouldn't listen to anything. And finally one day I just said, why are you calling me? You won't listen to anything. And you know what? It got really real because a month later she was dead. And I've watched that happen. And and I know I've been around enough to know that you will watch that happen many times the longer you stay sober. And today I just hope that I can be an example to the people that come in here that, you know what, your dreams do come true, that you don't get everything you want, that um, but God gives you exactly what you need. And I don't have all the answers, and my story isn't over yet for sure. And um, the most beautiful part, and then I'll close, is that, so I recently went to my first leadership in this job, I'm a, I always wanted to be a director. God has a sense of humor again. He put me in a room with eight other directors. And, you know, once again, he has to remind me, you're not that special. And, uh, uh, you know, and, I, and uh, so I went to my first leadership, and I was sitting there, and I was saying, oh, my God, like, I'm in the room with all these really important people. What am I going to do? Like, you know what? You've been begging your whole life to get your foot in this door. Now what are you going to do with it, Jill? Are you going to work hard? You know, because when I took this job, I called Roberta and I said, hey, I got this job. She goes, 
doesn't that take a lot of discipline? <laughs> and I thanks. And, uh, you know, <laughs> is that, you know, and so um, it, it is that you have to be very self-motivating, very self-focused and very self-directed. I'm sitting in this room and all of a sudden I'm sitting there and these are like the great God moments that happen. And I feel like this person looking at me and I turn around and it was Randy Babbitt. <laughs> and I said, oh, God, you sent me somebody to make sure I felt like I was at home. Thank you. And uh, he was just smiling at me. He never, we didn't even speak, but you know what? Like, just that's what happens in this program. You show up in places, and these you all show up in the strangest places. And it always seems to be right when I need you. Um, I don't think that's coincidence. And I just love these ladies. And um, for me, I think that if you're new tonight, if there's anything I can tell you, for me, it had to be... I had to make conscious contact with God, and I got that in a lot of different ways. They, I, th I think it was Christy, but when I got here, she said, take God with you everywhere. Mm -hmm. Open his door, pour his coffee, fasten his seatbelt, and when you get in the car, spend all your time talking to him. And, you know, um, that really helped me um, to make it very real. And today... Every day, I, so I bought a house with, with trees in the back. I feel very close to God with nature. I feel, and I always have to laugh because I have to exercise a lot to get me out of the way so I can hear God. Because I am, I am a mess. And so when I'm running, I'm too tired to listen to myself, so I hear God in those moments. And I bought this house with trees in the back. And I go out there, and every morning I did it as simple as I could. Good morning, God. And I can still tell you today that I still struggle with when I sit out there, the first thing I think of is myself. And then I have to say, good morning, God. And then my day usually starts pretty good. And I talk to him when I'm out there. And I just, he's become my friend and I take him everywhere I go. And um, I am just so grateful to be sober. And I'm so grateful for all the beautiful people that have come tonight and that have come to support me and know me and know my story and just love me for who I am so that I can do that back. Thanks.